Gary Madison works for Farm Credit Council in Washington, D.C., which is the trade organization for the farm credit system. Farm Credit is a nationwide network of borrower-owned lending institutions providing credit for the nation's farmers and ranchers. As the vice president for Young Beginning Small Farmer Programs and Outreach, Gary seeks to identify and meet the needs of the next generation of farmers and ranchers as part of Farm Credit's enduring mission of service to agricultural, agriculture and rural America. Until recently, Gary was a small farmer operating a wholesale greenhouse business in New Hampshire, including raising cattle for the local freezer beef market. He holds bachelor's degrees in agronomy and biology from the University of Connecticut. And Tyler Madison is a credit representative with Farm Credit East, the largest lender to agriculture in the Northeast. He has had art articles published in industry publications like Grower Talks, Green Profit, and Progressive Forage. Tyler has also worked at the Boston Flower Exchange and on his family's greenhouse operation in rural New Hampshire. Tyler, Gary, take it away. All right, thanks, Jeff. I assume that all of you on the conference call are pretty good problem solvers. You've been walking around paying attention, uh, enables you to be capable managers of your farm operations. But can you tell me the next challenge that you're going to face? Are you prepared to find future success in your farm business? Or are you just going to manage what you've got now on a on a day-to-day -day basis? As beginning farmers, you're entering agriculture at a time when new economic realities are being defined. And rather than thinking of yourselves as just farmers and ranchers, I'd like to make the case that you should think of yourselves as farm business businessmen and women so that you're ready for the opportunities that will be coming your way. So what do I mean by new economic realities? OK, well, let's start with some facts from a 2007 USDA census. And that is that um, almost a third of farm households generate additional income by engaging in business ventures that are independent of their farm production. So they've got a farm business, but they do something else, some other business also. And those other businesses can be divided into two different kinds. Um, activity that's pursued. Um, can be either on-farm diversification, such as custom work or value-added processing or agritourism, you know, something like a corn maze, or a CSA, or other direct retail marketing channels. And the second type of non-farming activity is an off-farm business ownership of enterprises that are not related to farming, uh, something on Main Street. So in 2007, this on-farm, off-farm economic activity was worth $29 billion in additional farm household income. But something else happened in 2007, and that is, for the first time ever, direct-to-retail direct sales by all farms surpassed custom work to become the leading on-farm entrepreneurial activity in terms of farm, farm household participation. So for the first time in history, the primary avenue for diversification of farm businesses became direct-to-retail sales. And furthermore, each layering of an additional on-farm direct sales activity, such as having a CSA or a farm stand or other enterprise, will on average add an additional $9,000 of profit. So it's important to note that the one type of direct to retail activity shown on this map, CSA farms, is present in more than 8 out of 10 counties. Retail agriculture is everywhere in all parts of the country, and it's the most common form of on-farm diversification. So what about the economic effect on the rural communities where these off-farm enterprises are located? OK, the off-farm businesses that are owned by farmers and ranchers employed 811,000 full or part-time workers and generated an estimated $19.5 billion in labor income in 2007. Farmers and the businesses they operate are a huge part of the rural economy. And they're particularly important to the communities where farm families live and grow up so the seeds of this new economic landscape may not be cropping up on your farm, but it's certainly happening around you. You should get used to the idea of thinking of your neighboring farmer and yourself as rural entrepreneurs. In your career as a farmer, as a rural entrepreneur, you are likely to own several businesses over your lifetime. More than one will be an off-farm business. So what are the consequences of this new arena for farm business people? It means you have the capability to be a major economic force in your community. Your entrepreneurial skills will be highly portable from farm to off-farm enterprises. This will result in greater occupational mobility into and out of farming, which will be a natural part of your life as a rural entrepreneur. From my perspective as a farm lender, 
holding more than one job and operating multiple enterprises will be common. In my loan portfolio, which is very heavily weighted towards retail agriculture, I think it is common. I see diversification as a stable path of income generation, as long as you're not wandering into the realm of business ADD, which happens when you continually start new enterprises and can't concentrate well enough on any of them to operate profitably. While there is merit in the risk mitigation aspect of diversification, there's also a lot to be said for focusing on doing what you're good at and building on that strength. To do that effectively means business planning which will help illustrate what's enough and what's too much. In this farm entrepreneurial endeavor, your primary tools in planning will be a business plan and a budget. A business plan is a narrative or list of why you want to do something, what you're going to do, and how you're going to do it. A budget is a plan in numbers, is the tool that projects if you'll make money, if it will be enough, and if there'll be cash available when you need it. We'll have examples of a simplified business plan and a simple budget for you later in this presentation. We want you to be prepared to thrive in an environment where you're likely to operate many separate enterprises on the farm, as well as own multiple businesses off the farm over the course of your careers. You should not just plan to succeed, you should plan to be happy. You should define how you define success, and happiness will change over time, so it's reasonable to expect that your goals and your plans are going to need to be altered over the long run. Effective business planning sets long-term goals and also prepares for the short-term emergencies. Now, you're prepared for a lot of contingencies already. You look both ways before you cross the street. You have lots of spare parts on hand. You install irrigation. You buy insurance. A lot of these things are best practices of how you manage risk by planning ahead. So you already do a lot of this kind of risk management. Managing risk by planning ahead is nothing new to you. Before you took a day off, you probably wrote lists of things to do for the folks who are looking after the farm while you were away. You also wrote down who to call if there was a problem. In a more complex and challenging business environment, you need to be able to plan ahead for more than just signing on to a webinar. As your business grows and evolves, it will require you to be more of a manager than a worker. Generally speaking, if you double the size of your business, you will need to devote four times as much effort to management. You may need help to do this, and you will need an understanding of how getting from your plan to your successful outcome happens. Without a plan, everything looks like a failure in the middle. If you were to chart the emotions involved in getting a farm business up and running, you'd have hope and confidence at the two ends of the scale and a valley of despair in the middle. That's when you've started to implement the plan, and it seems that nothing is working out right. You find more and more problems that you weren't expecting. Just to be clear, hope does not constitute a plan, and having confidence does not mean you're right. Sometimes the easiest person to fool is yourself. But if you have a business plan to work from, your mindset will change because you have measurable, incremental improvements that you can aim for. Having a business plan allows you to find a path to success through the darkest hours in that valley of despair. Now, there's a bit of psychology going on here, but I prefer to think of it as a tool for self-awareness rather than just fooling yourself. Because what a business plan allows you to do is anticipate failure. And by planning for the worst, it allows you to become more optimistic about getting through all the difficulties you're going to face. Minor failures become a learning experience rather than a catastrophe. Failing at small things becomes a way of learning if you do it in the context of knowing that you have a plan that serves as a yardstick or a feedback loop so you can learn from small failures, then adjust to achieve success. The trick is to be able to see the big picture, keeping in mind the mission of your business. Pick up any business self-help book and it will tell you the key to good management is to be more strategic and less tactical. In a farm business, that means less seeding and weeding and more long-term planning. Now, on, on our greenhouse farm business, our mission was to grow high-quality cut flowers that will delight both the purchaser and the recipient of the flowers. Now, you'll notice that my father's mission statement there for the farm, family farm business did not include uh, the word profit, which may be why he's now in D.C. working on policy stuff for farm credit. <laughs> no, well, wait, wait a minute. Uh, what Tyler says is true, but I'd point out that our larger life mission was to raise a family in a farm business environment and contribute to the well-being of the town we lived in. And I think we pulled that off okay. 
Tyler, you seem to have turned out okay, even though you you are fairly skeptical and you have a tendency tendency towards being argumentative. Okay, sure, but but let me offer another example of a mission statement from the cooperative that I work for. Farm Credit East is committed to the success of its customers by providing high value credit and financial services. As the mission statement it hits on the who, what, when, where, and how, it, it does what you want it to do. And it, as a bonus, it isn't full of meaningless advertising doublespeak. Well, you know, most people don't really take the time to think about what they want to do. It really is necessary to know what you want to do in terms of a business plan, but the hardest thing is to start. And that's why you need to put it in writing. If you don't determine what your mission is, why you are in business, and what is your ultimate goal, then you'll be letting unforeseen events and chance guide you. You will be at the mercy of circumstances, trying to sort out conflicting signals. You'll be no better than the smartest sheep in the flock, but you're always going to be running with everybody else. In my experience, people tend to get hung up on the difference between making a plan and predicting the future. I've heard farmers say, how can I make a budget when I don't know what the price of milk will be next year? And I have no control over that. I tell them it doesn't matter. Having a budget, that plan in numbers, allows them to anticipate what the price of milk will be next year and then adjust for changes in the marketplace. Often the hardest part is taking a leap and putting pen to paper. So let's get started. This one-page business plan is intended to show how easy it is to write down some thoughts about your business. It was created to demonstrate how to think about business planning to begin the process. It is not intended that you fill this out and hand it in like some homework assignment. A business plan is a communications tool for communicating with your partner, your spouse, your family members, your employees, your lender, and for yourself as a way to organize and remember your thoughts. After all, a business plan doesn't do any good if it's only in your head. For a lender, a business plan probably needs to be more than one page. The length of the plan depends on how complex your business is, how big it is in terms of assets, your familiarity with your lenders, the, with the type of business that, uh, that you're proposing. So on this slide that we're looking at, the core ideas that you'll likely want to address are people and financial and production and marketing. Now, keep in mind this isn't a science. Other people are going to have different ideas about what should be included in a business plan, but that's what we thought was important. All right. So I've prepared a one-page business plan for a hypothetical business in which I am the sole proprietor and I have one employee. My mission statement references the three things that I think are most important about running a business, quality, profits, and ethics. Uh, the mission statement is, the mission of Tyler's Tip Top Tomatoes, LLC, is to grow good food, make good money, and be good people. If you look below the mission statement, you'll see that the first objective is about being a good person, which includes spending time with my family, taking, taking Sundays off, right? Uh, this is a SMART goal, meaning that it's specific, measurable, attainable, rewarding, and timed. I have identified the things that I need to do in order to take Sundays off in the action plan, which is below the SMART goal, right? I need to train Charlie, who's my only employee, uh, for all the things that I do on Sundays, uh, and to make sure that he has the resources to um, to handle something in case something goes wrong. So I gave him all the numbers that he would need to call for that. And I don't just want to decide to do this and let it run uh, and, uh, and, and not know how good a job Charlie's doing. So I've decided that I'm going to check in on him on a, on a quarterly basis since it's a small operation um, and make sure that he's doing what uh, he needs to be uh, and, and tell him that also. So um, that wasn't too hard, was it? So I went ahead and made some other objectives. Um, so objective two, which lines up with making money, uh, or sorry, which lines up with, um, with uh, financial, uh, is, and uh, objective three is for uh, increasing efficiency, and objective four is for uh, some marketing ideas. Um, and uh, objective two, back to objective two. Uh, I've decided that I need to make enough money to pay myself, uh, the bank, and reinvest in the farm. So that goal, which is specific, measurable, attainable, rewarding, and timed, um, is uh, to make a net profit, uh, including my salary, which is 
also called a draw, uh, of $50,000 for this operating cycle. And how I intend to follow through on that is to compare the cash flow budget to my profit and loss and bank accounts monthly, making sure that I make the adjustments as needed. So um, for my production goal here, objective three, um, and SMART goal below that, I wanted to decrease the cost of goods sold per pound of tomatoes. To do that, I'm going to measure the production um, of, of everything I do, right? Uh, how much time Charlie's putting into it, how much time I'm putting into it, and, uh, and keep records on a, on a per variety basis. Um, which, uh, since labor is basically my biggest expense, um, I, I wanted to have a really good handle on that, and this is, this is the way that I can do that. Um, I also wanted to make sure that I had my pest control options or costs under control. So I'm going to take uh, a, a lower cost IPM approach, uh, set pest traps and scout, um, and, uh, and see how that goes and, and evaluate that on a regular basis. Um, I'm also going to introduce some new varieties each year to, uh, to keep my customers interested in my business. So I've decided to spend some time and money um, on researching some new varieties uh, here in Smart Cold B uh, and, and introduce a new variety each year. Um, but I don't want to do it just because. I'm going to measure the yield and make sure that I'm choosing the best new variety that I can. So the final objective here is that I wanted to increase communications with my customers. And uh, my SMART goal below that was to maintain a blog to show them about what I'm doing on the farm. And uh, back to uh, being good people, I wanted to uh, partner with a, a local nonprofit, uh, which is a soup kitchen, and have a tomato soup contest uh, with some of my customers. I thought that would be a pretty neat way to showcase not just my product, but uh, our involvement in the community. and. Uh, and I thought it would be a pretty good uh, thing to, to spend some time on. So, uh, but a project like that is pretty complicated, and it could pretty easily use its own one-page business plan. <laughs> I recommend that you you print down a few of these slides of the. Uh, let's go back to this to the blank one-page business plan um, to to use and keep around in your uh, in the glove box of your truck, so that when you have a good idea. You can write it down and immediately think about the SMART goals like Tyler's done here to fill in a little bit more detail about what you need to do. Remember, this, this one-page business plan is not a final business plan. It's not what you're going to hand into uh, your lender in order to um, look for a loan. It's something that you are going to use to help yourself remember what you want to do and plan for the future. So I mentioned a budget before. I wanted to figure out what I needed to change from my historical numbers to one, afford some new debt, and two, bring home a little more money. So the calculation over here on the, the left-hand column uh, is uh, my historical numbers. Uh, I grossed $200,000. $120,000 of that was uh, direct expenses uh, for the creation of the product cost of goods sold, which left me with $80,000 of gross margin, which is 40% of my gross sales. Um, of that $80,000, I spent $60,000 on overhead, which uh, is typically made up of the, the things that we abbreviate as the dirty five, which is depreciation, interest, repairs, taxes, and insurance. Those are not direct production expenses. It uh, wouldn't matter how many tomatoes I grew, those numbers are still going to be the same, um, which left me with a $20,000 uh, net income or profit, which is 10% of my sales. So um, I figured out over here on the right that um, I wanted to, to bring home a little more than $20,000. I wanted to bring home thirty. dollars um, the project that I am contemplating, I'm going to have to pay the bank back uh, $20,000 a year, um, which means that I need to generate $50,000 of profit as opposed to the 
uh, 20 that I had made the year before. Um, since I'm not really changing anything about the structure of my operation in this example, um, my overhead expenses are going to stay the same, uh, which is $60,000. But uh, I'm going to need more gross margin uh, than the $80,000 that I had the year before. I'm going to need $110,000. So um, to figure out how much I need in gross sales to, to generate that $50,000 of total profit, um, I took the COGS percentage that I had before, which is 60%, uh, also represented by point, or 0 0.6 here in the math. Um, so said a different way, that's 100% minus 60% equals 40%. So I'm dividing that $110,000 by 0.4, which gets me $275,000. That's the sales that I need in order to generate $50,000. Um, in this example. Now, Tyler, I'd, I'd add to that <clears throat> description that you can see on this slide that the, the instructions are all right on this slide, um, and also some resources for uh, looking up your, um, your historical costs. If this is your first year in business, obviously you're not going to have good business records, and there are places to find them online, there, which are shown up under number one. Um, but this illustrates, uh, even a simple budget like this illustrates the need to have really good record keeping because the records that you keep from uh, this year are going to be what you base your operation on next year because that's going to be the best available information for um, your costs and your ability to produce a profit. Also, um, on the uh, these this uh, one-page business plan and one-page financial plan is available on the www.foodshedguide.org website, uh, which we'll show you later, uh, which we'll list later. And uh, on that site, these two forms are available for download so that you can uh, download either the slides from this webinar or go to foodshedguide.org and capture these slides and, uh, and print them off so that you'll have them available to you on an ongoing basis. But this, is the, uh, this budget is about as basic as you can get, understanding that you need to have some place to start. You have to have some assumptions of what your sales, what sales you want to have, what your cost of goods uh, sold will be, and the various other factors that make this up. Tyler, any other thoughts on this before we leave it? Most budgets are going to be more complicated than this. Uh, something like this isn't uh, isn't really enough uh, for a lender. They're typically going to want to see a monthly uh, cash flow budget, um, which which this is not, um, it, which is more complicated. Um, and but there's some great resources out there for for uh, um, a, a a budget like that. Um, I seem to remember a really good article from uh, a professor at Purdue. Um, and uh, but but if you've never done budgeting before, start with something like this, and uh, and and uh, the next steps will be easier. And what you're going to prepare for your own individual business is is likely to be slightly different than what any what either Tyler and I are saying to you now, or what what any book or website is going to tell you, because it's going to it's going to represent what you are what you need to communicate about your business. A, a less complicated, more typical business is going to be need less of a business plan than a more complicated business that may not be familiar to the loan officer that you're talking to if your business plan invi involves any debt. And of course, we're not saying uh, you need to have debt to be in business. Uh, the only reason that you should consider debt as a part of your business is if you can fill out at least a budget this simple, if not much more detailed to be able to prove to yourself that if you borrow money, you're going to be able to make a profit and pay back that, that money. Because in the end, that's what your lender wa wants to see is how you're going to pay the money back. Uh, 35, I guess it's 40 years ago, uh, 35 years ago when I started in business, um, my business plan that I showed to my banker was about five pages long, and it was all numbers. 
Uh, it was a lot of historical data from a farm that I had worked for and a lot of projections into the future of how I was going to make money and pay the loan back. And it was pretty light on any kind of description uh, because I figured that's what I was there for. Um, and uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend going to a lender like that now. It's certainly a lot better to have your mission statement written down, your goals, uh, a little bit more of how you're going to market something. All the things that, that Tyler talked about in that one-page business plan should be expanded in a fuller business plan. Um, but uh, I guess my point is you can have a different amount or different size, different amount of content in a business plan, and it can still serve your needs to communicate to that group of people that, uh, that need to know what you're talking about, your lender, your spouse, uh, your business partners, your employees, and, uh, and that person that looks back at you in the mirror yourself. If uh, no, this is a lender talking. But if if I were going to choose between, uh, if I could only get uh, a customer walking through the door and, and he was going, he or she was going to hand me a a business plan uh, or a budget, I would choose the one who had prepared the budget. Um, in many ways, the the budget's what determines the feasibility of the business plan. And uh, when when customers ask me about uh, writing a business plan, I I tell them that's the best place to start. Um, because when they're, once their budget is done, they'll know if they have a business plan that's worth writing uh, because it's, it's been tested by them for its, for its feasibility. And if you're, if you're the kind of person that isn't good with numbers, you, you think, oh, you know, that's not something I'm interested in. I want to grow carrots or tomatoes or whatever it is. Uh, that doesn't absolve you of the responsibility to understand your, a budget. And even if it's a lot more complicated budget than what we're showing you here in this one-page budget, uh, you still need to, even if you have a, a CPA on staff uh, or you go hire one or uh, whoever your financial advisor is, you still need to understand everything about the numbers in your business. You may not have to be able to do the bookkeeping yourself or come up with the uh, uh, ratios um, and, and doing all of the, the, the math that's related to financials. But you need to understand the story that your financials tell so that if your lender pokes his finger down on a, on a spreadsheet or on part of your budget and says, so what's this mean? How'd you get to that number? You darn well better be able to explain that uh, because it's your business. It's not your CPA's business. It's not your financial bookkeeper or record keeper's business. It's yours. And you need to understand the story that those numbers tell so that you can show that you have a grasp of how your business is going to earn money and how it's going to pay it back in terms of uh, repaying a loan. So the choice is up to you to make something out of this tool. Uh, this one-page business plan, uh, the, the degree to which you use it and use it to, to make some success out of it, um, it's all up to you. Nobody else is going to plan your success for you. And as, as you grow in business, in your business, and maybe even add other businesses, you're going to have to spend more time in management. Remember the four times rule uh, that Tyler talked about? The, the more, uh, the, if, if uh, uh, your business expands uh, by doubling in size, you're going to have to attend to probably four times the amount of management, which means planning. So the more your business grows, the more time you'll have to spend planning. Now, if you have a business plan and you're feeling pretty smug that you've already done this business planning thing, let me ask you a question. Um, are you ready for benchmarking? Are you ready for comparison to other businesses? <coughs> and and that, that illustrates a reason of why you should continue to look at a business plan. If you're going to think about expansion or starting another business, you have to understand what the assets are that you have, what you've accumulated, uh, so that you can decide how best to spend that money. Should you diversify on the farm with an additional farm enterprise, or should you buy a rental property next door? Uh, should you, uh, if, if a business opportunity comes along, no matter where that business opportunity is, whether it's on the farm or off the farm, you need to be able to know your capacity and that's a good example, I guess. 
uh, if the farm next door typically only comes up for sale once in a lifetime, will you be ready to buy it? And then should you be able to, should you buy it? Those kinds of, of uh, questions are answered by long-term planning. That's something that your business plan should address. You should be looking at a much farther horizon than just next year. So what happens when you reach your objectives? Uh, maybe now you have a family, you want to spend time with them. You want to be a coach for your kid's uh, ball team at school. Uh, maybe you even want to hire your kids in your own business and eventually even come up with a management and business transition plan. You know, the future seems a long way away when you're scrambling trying to get a crop into the ground and uh, organize the labor and get the resources there and get that irrigation uh, pump going because uh, you haven't had rain in, in a week and a half. I mean, and there's all sorts of short-term things you need to manage as a farm business manager, no matter what kind of operation you've got but you still need to be looking at longer term goals so that you can identify what success is in your mind and perhaps even best of all what you're going to do when you get there um, is this farm business that you've created something that your your children are going to want to take on so our suggestion is uh, continue to do things like this uh, invest in yourself you've been on this webinar to learn um, don't stop when, uh, when you uh, get off your computer, or hang up your phone, um, look at what you've got around you, look at the resources you've got. Don't stop learning about yourself and through the, the mechanism of using uh, business planning. We want you to succeed. We have confidence in you. Uh, we want you to plan to succeed uh, for the future and do it in a conscious and deliberate way and write it down so that you can communicate with everybody else around you so that they know that you're going to be a success as much as you are. Thanks. We enjoyed being with you today. Well, we do have plenty of questions, um, and, uh, and we can jump right into that. There's one question that uh, asks um, if the profit component of a business can fall under uh, an objective rather than uh, the mission statement. So this is in reference to the one-page business plan. Um, well, I guess it depends on on what kind of business you want to to have. Um, if if you're in business to support yourself and your family, then then I'd say it has to be. Um, if you're preparing a um, a business plan for a, a nonprofit farm school type of operation, maybe it doesn't. But but that operation does have to support itself. Uh, and uh, I guess it's incumbent on you to figure out how much of a priority that is. Um, otherwise, you're just spending other people's money, and they they can get tired of that. So you don't you don't have to plan to make a profit, but recognize that if you don't plan to make a profit, you're not going to be able to keep doing what you're doing without subsidizing it somehow with <clears throat> with earnings from a real job, an off farm job. Uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, is a measure of sustainability. One of the one of the things that a farm lender looks at is can you cover the family living expenses, so as to be able to allow the that that farm family to uh, to stay on the farm and live there and devote their attention and their efforts to the farm rather than constantly being in a situation where they're not earning enough from the farm business and have to seek uh, employment elsewhere and spend time elsewhere in order to keep the family together. That's right. Farming is a real job. It's, it's serious I, business. I cringe every time you say that. <laughs> All right. Um, we had a a question about uh, if you're starting a farm from scratch uh, and you don't have any historical records, um, I'd say that uh, your, your your best bet here is to uh, see what benchmarks you can get your hands on. Uh, this is typically going to be a university resource. It may be a, a, a farm credit that's willing to, to part with theirs. Um, the more standardized your business model is, uh, if you wanted to be, for example, a commodity uh, sales dairy farm, uh, 
uh, in New England, there's fantastic benchmark information for that. Um, all you need to do is call Farm Credit. But um, if you wanted to, for example, start an organic mushroom farm in your basement, you're going to have a lot harder time finding uh, a comparable uh, financial model for for you in a in a in a business model like that. Um, so the short answer is try and find a benchmark. Um, and uh, if that doesn't work, then um, then you're very brave indeed. <laughs> Um, a specific question about the uh, financial plan that you demonstrated either, which is, why did bank payments come out of profits, um, not not already in as part of the, why are they not already in as part of the business expenses? Sure. Um, this the, the true answer to this is, is really an accounting one. Um, principal on debt is, is not an expense. Um, and, and I know that's a hard thing to think about because it's it's real. Often it's a really big expense. Uh, you know, it's coming out of your bank account. You got to pay it every month. But it's not a, a, a true expense. Uh, a, certainly, according to the IRS or or the generally accepted accounting principles, that your your tax preparer or accountant is uh, is uh, required to to live by. Um, so um, you you borrow money. Um, so somebody has, has lent it to you, you pay it back, those adjustments all happen on your balance sheet rather than happening in your profit and loss. Um, so that, that's a very long discussion about uh, accounting principles um, and there, there are other resources out there that, that would be able to, to help you find out more on, on, on that. But, uh, I'd, I'd say, Tyler, I'd, I'd, I'd describe it as in a shorter way that when you borrow money, Money that you actually pay back um, isn't an expense because you you borrowed it and you're giving it back. What what is the expense is the cost of renting that money, which we call interest. So the principal making a principal payment um, isn't an expense, but the cost of renting that money, just like the cost of renting land, is an expense. Maybe you should be the banker. <laughs> Um, uh, a question about uh, uh, how to manage a, um, a diversified business. Um, say an operation that Sky mentions is, has veggies, has flowers, has livestock. Do you do three separate budgets since there's different gogs and profit, or do, should you do a, a unified budget? Um, Both. Yeah, it, they, it, that's not a difficult answer, or not a difficult. Uh, thing to answer for the producers that I see doing it, um, and uh, I would say that that the ones who keep the best records uh, about it do that, which is called enterprising. Um, and uh, enterprising really happens uh, from with with just your gross sales and your cogs, and the overhead expenses are are shared, right? Uh, you're you're going to have, generally speaking, the same insurance for all of your operation. Um, you know, same farm truck, whether it's, uh, you know, harvesting veggies, flowers, or, or moving livestock around. Um, so, so the answer is yes, you would probably want three different budgets to, to answer those questions. The more separated they are, the easier it is to do that. Um, and uh, if you think about really big businesses, um, they, they absolutely do that. And, the, you know, the, you know the, the financing arm of General Electric is very different than the, the one that makes washing machines. Uh, that's from enterprise. From a from a small farm perspective, if you have a a uh, a diversified farm enterprise with vegetables and livestock and um, even sell through different marketing channels, um, you really want to separate out those expenses so you can determine the cost of each of those enterprises because you may find that you're earning a lot of money uh, in the CSA part of your business and losing a lot of money in the livestock uh, wholesale part of your business, just as an example. Because it's it's so easy to hide expenses without keeping accurate records. And that would include things like uh, making sure that you write down the amount of labor that each of, that whether it's your own labor or whether it's your hired labor, the time that you spend doing different parts of your enterprise. 
Um, that's a really hard thing to have the discipline to accomplish, but that's how you can determine where you should spend your time. Uh, if, you, if you keep records, you'll be able to compare. Uh, the hardest thing to do in, in starting to keep records is that you, uh, it's hard to see the benefit of it because you don't have a comparison. Your records become extremely valuable next year because then you have something to look back on and say, oh yeah, um, I spent way too much on labor for the value of that crop of green beans that I got so little return on. Um, so it's, it's kind of the discipline. Keep the records now, um, be able to use them in the future. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and compare them. You can also compare them against, against these benchmarks. Um, so, um, uh, if if uh, if on the other end there there isn't a benchmark, if the, if you're creating um, what seems to be quite a new business model, um, do you do you um, base your model on uh, what seems to be somewhat similar? Um, do you, do you make up a new business model entirely? Um. Yes, basically, uh, you, you're, you're making up a new business model entirely, or, or at least not one that it's going to be easy to share uh, your your um, your your certainly your gross margin ratio or your net profit ratio with other people, um, and that's uh, I mean that's that's something that, for example, CSA farmers have had a a, a challenge with for a long time. Um, even though they communicate with each other, at least around here, they communicate with each other a lot, um, and uh, and you know, Farm Credit tries to step into the gap where that where that need is perceived. Um, so we've we started a, a CSA benchmark to to try and figure out some of those things. Um, we have benchmarks for other uh, other enterprises, but it really only covers the Northeast uh, and our market area. And uh, for those of you not around here. Uh, it, it also takes, it is heavily influenced by the very high price of land around here. Uh, and it may not be useful to somebody in, you know, Alberta, Canada, or, uh, or Iowa. So. But, uh, um, but by the same token, Tyler, the uh, um, having a benchmark from, from, whether it's from farm credit or from cooperative extension in your own state, is a better place to start than just making it up um, off the top of your head, that there's there's uh, the value of a of a poor benchmark is still better than than probably just guessing. Uh, and I'd point out that in a previous National Good Food Network webinar, um, which you can find on the uh, NGFN website, you can download the slides for um, the CSA benchmarking webinar, and that would have some very specific. Uh, percentages that relate to the one-page business plan as far as where you would see expenses, costs, uh, and, and revenues from a typical CSA. Um, so, uh, yeah, and let me just sort of re-emphasize, re uh, Farm Credit is a great resource, um, and uh, the other resource mentioned was, was um, the Cooperative Extension. Um, back to that uh, diversified farm with the three budgets. Um, do you share overhead? Do you just divide by three? Um, you, you could you could divide by three. That really wouldn't get it done, though. Um, the way I would approach it uh, to understand how you should allocate that overhead is uh, is the percentage of gross sales that each of those business enterprises are doing. So let me paint you a picture here. You're spending. Uh, 50% of your uh, or 50 percent of your gross sales come from the sale of vegetables 25 percent from flowers and 25 percent from livestock uh, so if you were going to allocate overhead you should use that same 50 25 25 um, allocation uh, of your overhead to understand which pieces of your business which enterprises are profitable okay. Um, a question about um, if a, a lender wants to see COGS and overhead broken out into separate line items, or can you just keep them as a total? Uh, 
the, the, the right answer is, is uh, how badly do you want that loan? Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's one thing to uh, provide a lender with a, a copy of your tax return, your Schedule F, and say, here you go, this is what I did. Um, and, but that's, for me at least, that's sort of the minimum acceptable um, financial information in order to be able to underwrite a loan. And sometimes that's fine, especially if the loan is smaller, it's lower risk. Uh, that's that's great. Uh, if it's a new enterprise, for example, absolutely. Um, you know, if if you just had it all bundled together with three lines and said, you know, I'm going to make uh, I'm going to make a hundred thousand dollars and I'm going to spend eighty thousand dollars on expenses and I'll have twenty thousand dollars of net profit, um, I I I wouldn't I wouldn't know how believable it was. Um, it uh, it, uh, it it doesn't provide me with any insight into how you intend to to manage without what I did uh, with my first and we're talking several three decades ago thirty years ago starting with my first the first time that I approached a lender um, and it was a, a commercial bank not farm credit uh, my business plan consisted of about uh, five pages of numbers. Um, I had a focus on uh, business performance and profitability and the, the cost of actually building the, the, uh, the greenhouse facility that we were going to be raising flowers in. And that I, I would, uh, you know, we, we got the loan, um, fortunately. But I, I think that the, the thing to recognize in what Tyler was saying is that if you're going to be talking to a banker, um, farm credit or a commercial banker, doesn't matter, you need to under, you need to recognize the language that they speak. Um, they're going to want to see numbers. They're going to want to be assured, uh, just like you would if you were going to lend money to a friend, you know, significant thousands of dollars to a friend. So what are you going to do with it and how are you going to make enough money to pay me back? Those are the kinds of questions that a lender is thinking about. Um, and, and so to address, address those questions in a lender's mind, uh, the more that you can demonstrate your understanding of the numbers of your business, I think the more impressed your loan officer is going to be. So like Tyler said, you know, for a small loan of a, a pretty simple, uh, uh, easy to understand business, maybe it tax returns and Schedule S would, would be sufficient. But, um, you're the best teller of the story of what you want to accomplish. You just have to make sure that you tell it both in, the, in that narrative form that you're probably really good at, as well as telling it in the, in the form of, of budgets and projected income and when in the year you're going to be earning that money. Um, the kinds of things that the banker is going to worry about of, uh, okay, you had a great, uh, a great production season, but how are you going to make your payment in January? Um, so, Putting putting your mind in the in the uh, uh, in the putting yourself in the mind of a lender is probably a, a good idea as you think about uh, getting together material to go and approach a lender. Well, I I think that's a, a great note to to end on. Um, the the nature of having over two hundred people uh, on a webinar is that there are questions we we're unable to get to so for that we uh, we apologize um, and I want to uh, thank Gary and Tyler I'm confident that you have a better sense how these one-page plans can help you on your way to improving your business and get you access to opportunities that without a business plan you wouldn't have so this webinar is being recorded it'll be archived on our uh, ngfn.org site and the foodshedguide.org site along with uh, also on the ngfn.org site You'll find uh, three dozen other webinars we've done in the past, uh, so feel free to send others who you think you would, would have liked to have heard this presentation, uh, and take some professional development time yourself and dig through our excellent archives. Um, again, that website is ngfn.org slash webinars, um, and this should be up within a few business days. Our webinars are organized into topics, so if you look in the left-hand navigation area, dig into whatever it is that interests you. We, uh, we do regularly offer these webinars. Um, generally, they're the third Thursday of each month uh, at 3.30 uh, p.m. Eastern Time. 
and sign-up links are at ngfn.org slash webinars also. In June and July, we're focusing on, on grass-based animal agriculture. First, we'll look at the strong markets for grass-based beef, including a market analysis that the Wallace Center has been doing for the past year, as well as a case study of a cooperative model we think can be replicated in many parts of the country. And in July, um, we'll look at the market and other benefits of transitioning to grass-based dairy. Again, we'll have a case study and an introduction to an apprenticeship program designed to effectively get new and transitioning ranchers up to speed on the different intensive management techniques. Um, <clears throat> The Wallace Center maintains several websites, uh, including foodhub.info, which is a food hub hub of information, research, case studies, a map of the many food hubs across the country, um, which uh, we uh, are keeping updated. Um, we also have a link to the uh, recently released food hub resource guide. Um, and uh, tomorrow we'll be releasing the um, archives uh, of our conference uh, th that we uh, took place uh, this spring. So um, you can listen to the recordings of all the sessions there. There are links to TA providers with experience in aggregation di distribution. If you are a TA provider or consultant on this call, you should take some time and create or update your profile on ngfn.org. This is becoming an established place for those in the need of assistance to find their help. So you want to be listed there. There are over 180 individuals and organizations. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. If you have a resource you'd like to share, let us know. Contact at ngfn.org or qfed at winrock.org. And foodshedguide.org mentioned <coughs> excuse me, on this webinar is our site for producers wanting to adapt to the changing food system food business landscape. We have uh, instructive text and case studies with an emphasis on how to have a viable business in a food value chain. Learn more about, for instance, factors to consider when deciding on a legal status such as LLC or C Corp. Moreover, that's where you can download the one-page business plan and financial plan. Um, we will also post the archive rec recording of this webinar, foodshedguide.org, for more. You can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. I'd like to encourage you to add your name, interests, and bio to our growing database. Um, again, uh, the NGFN is uh, filling its role there as acting as connector. Again, uh, if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or even easier, just let us know in the post-webinar survey that we'll launch in just a moment. We'll, we'll sign you up. Um, contact us at any time, contact at ngfn.org again, and we'd like to thank you for your time this early morning, uh, and let me encourage you again to fill out that survey. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.